Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So um, next up, it is my absolute delight to be able to introduce Eric Brynjolfsson, who is the uh, Schlüssel Family Professor at the MIT Sloan School of Business, director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy, as well as the co-author of The Second Machine Age, a book which many of you may have had the chance to read, and which is a New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post bestseller on the impact of new technologies on employment. So thanks very much, Eric. OK. Thank you, Michael. And it's a, uh, a pleasure to be here. You know, there are some strange things that have been happening recently, as you guys have all helped see and contribute to. Uh, cars are beginning to learn how to drive themselves. Uh, people are talking to their machines and expecting the machines to be able to answer back intelligently. Uh, machines are beginning to beat humans at games from chess and uh, space invaders. Uh, to tasks like uh, legal discovery, uh, diagnosing diseases, uh, reading x-rays and MRIs. And so these are in unusual times, but I'm an economist. I also see some interesting things happening in the economy. Um, we have record levels of wealth. There are more millionaires, billionaires than ever before. Uh, trillions of wealth have been created in the past decade at, at a record pace. Um, productivity is at an all-time high right now. Um, but we also have uh, lower median income. If you look at the person in the United States who's at the middle of the income distribution, uh, that person is poorer now than they were 15 years ago. Same thing is true for other advanced countries in Europe, Japan, Canada. Uh, the share of the population that's employed, the employment to population ratio, is lower now than it was uh, a decade or, or two ago. So there's some indicators that are, are puzzling going in different directions, uh, both on the technology side and in economics. And I believe that these are related, that these facts uh, are not coincidences, but that we are in the midst of a big transformation of the economy. And I think uh, the, the biggest societal and economic challenge and issue of our generation, and that is the way that uh, digital technologies and in particular uh, machine intelligence is going to affect work and employment and the economy more broadly. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that now. And uh, just to step back and give a little perspective on things, I'd first I'd like to uh, ask, um, who here would like to be able to have the power to change the world, to have the power to change the world? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, we got a, yes, looks like majority there. Okay, that's good. So, so what does it take to be able to change the world? Well. Um, there's many different answers to that question. I'm going to take a kind of an engineer's perspective and argue that uh, changing the world requires quite literally two things, a power system and a control system. A power system because the world is mostly made of atoms and held in place by powerful physical forces and, and you need to have physical power to, to change the world. But you also need a control system to decide how to arrange those atoms, how to organize things, and that's at least as important. Now, if you look at the broad sweep of human history, um, a really seminal change in living standards occurred in the late 1700s. Before that, most humans had pretty much the same miserable uh, living standards. And um, in the late 1700s, that was the, when the steam engine was developed, and that ignited the Industrial Revolution. And since then, there have been other powerful general purpose technologies, uh, electricity, the internal combustion engine. And they all could be thought of as providing more and more power for humans to manipulate the world. But of course, you still need the control system. And that meant that humans were a complement to these power systems. A, a, a locomotive without a, an engineer wouldn't be very effective. More recently, we're in what Andrew McAfee and I are calling the second machine age. And this is an era where machines are beginning to also be able to do some of the functions of the control system. To, to augment and automate some mental tasks. And we all know the technologies involved in that. And, a, and an open question is the extent to which these technologies will be a complement or a substitute for human labor. Through most of history, machines have been a complement. And we know that because the 
price of human labor went up. It was, became more and more expensive to hire a human. Humans became more valuable. But recently, as I mentioned, uh, wages have been stagnating, even falling, suggesting that um, we may not have technologies that are complementing labor the same way as before. Although I want to argue that none of this is going to be inevitable. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a little while. Um, in particular, at this conference, we should zoom in on some of the progress in machine intelligence and its role. And I've seen three big categories of, of tremendous change. And I'm sure as I, I spend more time at the, the rest of the workshop and today, I'll hear about some other things I should be up to speed on. But um, there's been enormous progress in interacting with the physical world, things like vision. Uh, there's been tremendous progress in language and in problem solving. Just to briefly give you some examples, most of you are more expert on this than I am. Um, we've seen uh, self-driving cars going down the highway. We've got uh, the DARPA Robotics Challenge, where some robots are able to uh, pick up objects, turn dials, in some cases walk up a set of stairs without falling down, in some cases not. Um, but um, there's definitely been a, a, a very visible progress in terms of some of those basic kinds of uh, physical tasks. And of course, a very quantitative way to look at that is what's happened with uh, uh, the ImageNet uh, tests and how much uh, that has improved just in the past five years or so from 30% to less than 10% uh, error rate. And I can give you lots more examples of, of those categories. Another big category is in language. Um, many of us, as I mentioned now, speak to our machines. Um, Tom Mitchell at Carnegie Mellon has said we are in the midst of a 10-year period. We went from machines mostly not being able to understand us to machines mostly being able to understand us. Of course, they're far from perfect. They're frustrating at times. But it's really, when you think about it, it's a big milestone in human history to be able to, to talk to your machines and have them understand what you're doing. And even to speak in different languages and have them translate it to other languages like Skype does now. Or to, to generate news stories. As many of you know, uh, there are tens of thousands of news stories. If you pick up uh, a newspaper today or Yahoo, you, you be careful. Read who the, the byline is. Often it will be someone like Narrative Science or Automated Insights that has written the story about stock reports or sports scores. That's another something we didn't see uh, 10 years ago or even five years ago. And uh, last but not least, it's the ability to solve many kinds of problems that couldn't be solved before. Um, there are call centers now where people call in and there are machines that are able to answer most of the basic questions. You take some of the, the technology that was in IBM's Watson, for instance, can't be used just for answering questions in game shows like Jeopardy, but also all sorts of questions that you might get in a call center that, of course, are manned currently by millions of men and women, but increasingly machines will answer some of those questions. Uh, legal discovery uh, software has gotten much better, and more and more legal uh, tasks can be done by them. Uh, in banking, investment advice, often more accurate and more uh, personalized than what humans can provide. Uh, many categories of medical diagnosis, if you go out to the poster session next door, you see uh, hundreds of examples of medical um, uses for neural nets. So what does all this mean for the economy? And it, it's really, there are two broad uh, lessons. The first is um, what we call the bounty, that there's just a lot more value created than ever before. Machines can create enormous wealth, and we've been seeing this for some time now in, in, with uh, digital technologies. Um, for instance, this uh, ad here is from the uh, mid-1990s at Radio Shack, and someone pointed out to me that virtually every item for sale, hundreds of thousands of, thousands of dollars worth of, uh, of goods and services from computers to uh, cameras and video cameras, answering machines, if any of you remember what those were, um, telephones, of course, um, calculators, they're all available for no additional cost as embed in, a, in an iPhone or a, an Android phone. They're, they're basically apps now. Um, and there are apps that do things we never could have done before. Uh, back then, there was no GPS uh, uh, for civilian use. The military had some systems that cost uh, millions of dollars. Uh, later, there were GPS that cost hundreds of dollars. Now, um, I have five different GPS apps on my phone that give me directions that are far better than anything those other devices did. They include traffic and other information. There are systems that will help diagnose cancer and, and detect uh, skin moles, um, a number of new things that couldn't have been counted before. What's interesting is that all those free goods that are available for zero-cost apps or on the web with things like Wikipedia, um, they don't, aren't counted in the GDP. 
they aren't part of our economic statistics because they had zero price. And GDP measures the value of all the goods and services bought and sold. And so there's a big uh, shortfall in the way we measure our economic statistics. And economists are beginning to recognize that we're missing more and more of the value of our, uh, or the real value that is being created by new technologies. And the GDP statistics ripple into mismeasurement in the productivity statistics, which are also based on uh, the same national income accounts. Um, and going forward, there's a lot more value that could be created. If you just do a 1% better match in terms of skills to jobs, that's worked out to be at about a trillion dollar opportunity globally for uh, improved welfare. And so there's, that's, that's um, just scratching the surface of what could be done. But the other thing that's happening, in addition to the bounty, is that there's been a decoupling of uh, wealth from work. And there are a number of economic indicators. Here I list four of them that used to be tightly coupled. Productivity, GDP per person, private employment, and median family and income. And for most of the century, those rose in tandem. There was literally, a, you, know, you could think of it as a rising tide that rose, that lifted all boats. As productivity went up, automatically, it seemed, income would go up along with it. But the past decade or two, they've become decoupled. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, median income now is somewhat lower in the United States than it was in the late 1990s. And that's also a worldwide uh, phenomenon, at least in advanced countries. Um, so that's something that's increasingly concerning, this decoupling of wealth creation from what's happening in the middle and bottom of the income distribution. Now, how is this possible? Um, because I used to think that if you just made the pie bigger, I think the rest of it would take care of itself. But now it's clear that that's not true. Um, in particular, digital progress, while it does make the pie bigger, there's simply no economic law that everyone will automatically benefit. It's possible for some people to be made worse off, even as the pie gets bigger. And that group of some people could be quite large. Centuries ago, it was maybe a few percent of the population. Recently, it may be 50, 60, 70 percent of the population that isn't in the winner's category. Economists call this skill, or call this a bias technical change. And there are three categories of bias technical change that are relevant. That is technological change that helps one group and hurts another group. The one that's been most studied and most documented is called skill bias technical change. The fact that technology may make some types of skills more valuable and others less valuable. In particular, more educated workers have often benefited at the expense of middle and less skilled workers. Um, you can see that with certain technologies that are introduced um, that uh, automate some very routine, simple, and often lower paid jobs. Um, you can see it in what's happened to the, the wages of different um, people with different levels of education. Uh, in the 60s and the, the earlier than that, um, all uh, groups had rising wages. Even if you were a high school dropout, your wages were rising. In the 70s, there was sort of a knockdown with the oil shock. And since then, they've fanned out with people with more education um, getting substantially higher uh, incomes and wages than people who have some college, high school, or high school dropout. And just to calibrate this for you, most, uh, most Americans, most Canadians um, are in the category of some college or less. So they're in the green line or, or lower in terms of their, um, their educational background. And in particular, as, as uh, we zoom in further, in recent years, it's been the middle of the income distribution, not the bottom, that's been especially hard hit both in terms of wages um, on the right and in terms of employment on the left, we see that middle income jobs have had a big drop in demand. And that has been affecting both their wages and their employment. And going forward, you can see that more and more types of jobs are going to be affected. So different types of skills are going to be affected. Uh, lawyers are not immune. Doctors are not immune. I'm not sure whether uh, economics professors are immune. We'll find out. The second big category of bias technical change is uh, capital versus labor. People like Thomas Piketty have written a little bit about this. And for most of history, there was sort of a dance where capital and labor, the, the shares bounced around a little, but they mostly didn't change too much. In fact, this was called a Caldor fact when I was in graduate school, that the, the, the labor share of GDP was a, essentially a constant. But as you can see there, in the past uh, 15 years or so, the labor share of GDP has begun to plummet while the share going to capital has risen. And this is true not just in the United States, but even in developing countries like China and other developed countries like Japan and Germany. It also seems to be a worldwide phenomenon. And it's only just in the early stages. Um, 
as you can see from this, uh, this chart on the right there, the number of robots in, in use is uh, beginning to grow much more steeply than it did previously, and many of them are going to replace people like the workers there on the left. Um, there are plans for entirely automated robot-based uh, factories going forward. So that will have a big change in the capital labor ratio in those, comp in those particular companies and factories. Now, there will be jobs created in other locations, and the real question is whether or not those will be enough to offset the capital labor change in the specific places where these are implemented. And you can imagine not just in factories, but uh, Travis Kal Kalanick, and this is how he really does talk, he pointed out that there's no, when there's no other dude in the car, the cost of taking Uber anywhere becomes cheaper than owning the vehicle. And uh, as you know, uh, those plans are well underway. Maybe we may hear in the panel about how imminent that may be. And last but not least, the third category I would touch on is superstars versus everyone else, in particular the, the very top of the income distribution. Um, digital technologies are different than other goods and services. In particular, once you take a, a process or a good or a service and digitize it, you can replicate it and make a copy or 10 copies or 100 million copies. And each of those copies has three interesting properties. Uh, they can be replicated at virtually zero cost. They are exact replicas of the original, indistinguishable. And they can be transmitted anywhere on the planet almost instantaneously at the speed of light. Free, perfect, and instant are three adjectives we haven't used for goods and services as economists in most of history. But they're standard. They're automatic when you have a digital good. And that, of course, leads to some very different economics. In particular, it can lead to, to a power law distribution of income and winner-take-all markets. Um, here's a distribution of not the 1%, but the 1% the has their own 1%, and that is the 0.01%. And as you can see, the share of uh, income in the uh, economy, both in the United States and other countries, that goes to the 1% has been trending upward quite steeply. And there are, again, a number of reasons for this, but one of them is these digital and network technologies lead to power laws and much more concentration in the, or they can lead to much more concentration at the top of the income distribution. So what's going on? Well, we're having some tremendous advances in our digital technologies, but our organizations, our skills, and our, our institutions are not keeping pace. We're having a bigger and bigger mismatch between them. In some ways, we, this also happened in the Industrial Revolution that I alluded to earlier. And right now, there are a lot of people who are not participating in the bounty that is the, the biggest first order impact of these technologies. And so what is to be done? Well, I pointed to a couple of grand challenges on the technology side. Inspired by those, uh, we are putting together a new grand challenge at the Initiative on the Digital Economy. And it's inspired by the fact that while digital technologies will continue to accelerate, our skills and organizations and institutions are not changing nearly as rapidly. And that means that business as usual will not solve this particular problem. So we need to think hard about how we can reinvent our economy and our society to keep up with these uh, changes. We can't use the same institutions that worked in the industrial age. There's a very different fundamentals of the economy going forward. And we have to think about how to adapt those what kinds of new skills, what kinds of new organizations are going to be needed to be effective going forward. And let me just leave you with one closing thought, which is that technology is a tool. And I'm often asked whether this tool is going to uh, make us better off or worse off. Is it, or am I an optimist or a pessimist? And I think that's the wrong way to think about it. The right way to think about it is it's a tool, and that means it all depends on what we decide to do with the tool. The tool doesn't decide for us. It is something that we can use in many different kinds of ways, just as earlier tools were. And we have to think about how we want to use this particular tool. The good news is we have a more powerful tool at our disposal, more powerful set of tools at our disposal than we ever had before. And now it's up to us to take advantage of that. In many ways, we have more choice than we ever had before as well. Thanks very much. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you.